Good morning, everyone. That <laughs> was not the sound guy. That was me. Uh, good to see you all. And uh, my name is Eric, to be one of the pastors here. And uh, we're going to continue on our series called Give Me Faith. We're walking through the book of Genesis. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's word. We are in Genesis chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are here in this place. So God, I just pray right now that we just be aware of what you're doing, uh, how you've already been working in our lives, leading up to this moment right here, right now. God, help us to hear what you want us to hear, to receive from you the things that you want us to receive. And God, let us just release those things that we've been carrying, those things we've been holding on to that, God, uh, we need to give over to you. In your name we pray. Amen. You can take a seat. Oh, thank you. Um, I love movies. Anyone else big fan of movies? Thank you, Mel. Yeah, uh, I, I loved just going, had that experience of, of going to a, a good movie and just kind of losing myself for a while in that movie. Uh, does anyone know? Um, you can shout it out. The movie that has grossed the most money of all time. Avatar. Avatar. Yeah, yeah. All right. We have a $100 gift card. This is now, uh, I'm kidding about the prize, but this is Avatar 2 that just came out. I saw the movie just a couple weeks ago with my son. I loved it. And uh, for $1,000, I could not tell you the name of these characters. Uh, it's a great movie, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know who these people are. Okay, I know one. This is Jake. That's it. The rest of them, I don't know their names. It's funny. Uh, first movie, too, like most highest grossing movie of all time, and I don't even know the names of the characters in there. It's more about kind of the story being told. Uh, but I was watching this movie recently with my son. It was his first ever 3D movie, very immersive in it. And uh, these two are married. They have some kids. And I remember... This is the, one of the main characters. See, I don't even remember her name from the first movie, uh, second movie. But she marries Jake. And, and in this, the Navi, that's the people, they have this way of talking that really hit me and it impacted me is when someone has your respect, when someone you want to know they are valued and, and a member of your tribe, they say, I see you. And, and she says, I see you, my Jake. And she calls him my Jake. That's it. His name is Jake. And I love that. And there's this moment where he's got some kids. And he, as a dad, he's kind of harsh on his sons. And, and there's kind of the oldest son and then a, a middle son. And it's a classic, like, the son's trying to earn their dad's approval. And there's a moment when the dad looks at his middle son. And it's very impactful. And he, he says, I see you, my son. And I just thought, man, isn't that the desire that we all have to be seen, to be noticed. I think even the most introverted person who likes to maybe just slip in and back, come late to church, leave early, we still want to be seen, right? We don't want to truly be invisible. And today we're going to look at that idea of, of where do you in life most need to be 
seen? Do you feel seen? And, 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 and so what do we do when we don't feel seen? What happens to us? I think a lot of times when we don't see seen or valued or that we don't matter, that leads to frustration in us. It leads to us feeling devalued. And, and what happens when we feel frustrated? I know in my life, I, there's been many times I've felt frustrated. I've shared many of those frustrations with, with you all. You know, Kristen and I, we wanted to be parents, and we instantly got pregnant right away uh, when, when we were newly married and decided after two years of marriage, okay, let, let's, let's have kids. And I was like, whoa, this is super fast. I was on a, a, a youth outreach event, and she told me. And then at 12 weeks, we, we miscarried and lost that baby. And then we miscarried again. And then we didn't get pregnant for three years, and we didn't know. Are we ever going to be able to have kids? And that led to a lot of frustration. And then we were blessed able to have kids. But then I remember after a season of some rough ministry for us in Wisconsin and, and resigning from that and not sure what to do and being jobless for about a year or so. And that was very frustrating, wanting to have a job, wanting to be back in ministry and just kind of waiting for that. Uh, you know, being homeless, living in my parents' basement, looking for a house and trying to find the right one, the frustration of trying to find, you know, uh, the right place to live. There's been times I've been frustrated about lack of time or money, or now that we do have four kids, I can often be frustrated by lack of sleep. Uh, Last night, having multiple kids in our bed again, and it's like, this can be so frustrating, but frustration can take many different forms. But I think today we can ask, what would it look like if we had a life where frustration doesn't get the best of us, what would that look like? What would, what would it look like to feel seen and known and loved and know how to appropriately deal with our frustration? Well, fortunately, we aren't the only ones to have these feelings of frustration. Uh, this, this has happened you know, for thousands of years, and God's word records a lot of the frustrations that people had. And we've been journeying with Abram and Sarai since the start of the year, and they've been promised a lot of great things, but we're also going to see they have some pretty major frustrations. Uh, and today we're going to be in Genesis chapter 16. And this is where Father Abraham, the kind of the father of our faith, gets a girlfriend, <laughs> which is not good, all right? Abraham and Sarai, they're going to try to help God out, but they end up making things much, much worse. See, what's happened is for years, Sarai has tried to get pregnant, and, and she's starting to get frustrated, and it's not working, and I know what that feels like. And so what we're going to see If you're taking notes, you can write this down, that out of Sarai's barrenness, she's going to create a burden for Hagar, something that Hagar, her servant, didn't ask for. And sometimes when when we get frustrated, we can take that out on others and create burdens that that person never asked for. Sometimes we look at the patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like they're these superheroes in the Old Testament, but they aren't. They're real flesh and blood people that made real mistakes. They had real frustration. We've seen Abram move from faithfulness to, and then back to kind of faithlessness, and then back to walking by faith, and now we're going to see him walk in complete unfaithfulness, where he just really stops trusting God. This is really one of the worst days in Abram's life, where he makes a big mistake. We're not looking at this story so we can make fun of him, but to realize that if God can still use Abram after making some pretty massive mistakes, then hopefully even if we've made some big mistakes in our life, that God can still use us. Kind of in our timetable, it's, it's been about 10 years, a whole decade since God promised Abram, I'm gonna make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. You're gonna have all these descendants. And just imagine Abram and Sarai. And if you've gone through a season of infertility, if you're in there now, that, that month by month waiting, is it gonna happen this month? No. Is it gonna happen this month? No. And that's where they're at. And Abram experienced delay on the way to his destiny. And how you choose to deal with delay can determine how you're gonna experience your destiny. When, when God hasn't waited yet, when he's delaying to do what he's promised to you, how you respond to that is gonna determine how you experience that your destiny, really. And so what do we do when we're waiting? We believe God's promised something and we're still waiting and waiting and waiting. That's what we're going to see today. It's been 10 years, 10 years since God said, I'm gonna make you into a great nation and yet his wife can't get pregnant. 
But how many of you know that just because something is outside of our control, it doesn't mean that we don't have a choice in how we respond, right? All of us have these things that happen to us that are outside of our control. We still have choices on how we're going to choose to respond in those moments and choose to respond to these circumstances. What we're going to see is that both Sarai and Hagar are going to be frustrated. Sarai is barren. Hagar is going to get burdened with something she didn't ask for. All right, 16.1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, princess, no matter what her name means, had borne him no children. And she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. At this point, Abram's about 85 and Sarai's 75. It's been 10 years since they promised him a son. And God's promise to them doesn't just concern this desire to have a son, but it relates to God's purpose to bless the whole world the line of Jesus comes from Abraham. And, and so if, if they don't have children, if they don't have the line of Abraham, then how is God going to fulfill this promise to bless the whole world? The promised Messiah is going to come through them if they don't have any kids. You know, they're blessed to be a blessing. But how that's going to happen, how can they be a blessing if they don't have a baby? And Hagar is like Sarai's kind of personal assistant. And where did they get this woman from? From Egypt. Remember, when they, they go to the promised land, the promised land turns out to be a famine land. They go down to Egypt. Should have never gone down there. Uh, Abram loses his wife, gets her back through God's providence, and they come back with people in possessions, and they come back with Hagar. And what we see is that when you sin, you always pick up baggage. Now, I'm not saying Hagar herself is baggage, but they shouldn't have brought her back. She shouldn't have been working for them. But when we take things into our own hands, when we sin, the result is always some kind of baggage. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that because of sexual sins in their past has affected their current marriage. Or choices they make on, hey, I was dishonest in my business. Well, you're going to pick up that baggage. Um, just the reality is when we sin, we pick up baggage. And Abraham and Sarai, they never should have gone down to Egypt and they pick up Hagar and we're going to see how that affects things now. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. We can see the bitterness in Sarai. She's like, God has stopped me from getting pregnant. He has prevented me from bearing children. She's angry and bitter at God. Have you ever been angry and bitter at God? I have. <laughs> I think if we're being honest, many of us have had seasons where things don't go the way we think they will. And it, we can easily be angry and bitter at God. It doesn't make it right, but I think we've all had those frustrations. So here's her plan. She's like, I got this young hottie who works for me, and I'm going to send her in to my husband, and then she'll get pregnant and give me the baby, and I'll be sitting in my nursery rocking the baby, and it's all going to be good. That's her plan. She's like, God's not moving fast enough so I, I, I'm going to jump in. Is this part of God's plan? No. What is God's plan? It's one man, one woman in a covenant relationship forever. Not one man, one woman, and a website full of women. Not one man, one woman, and a whole bunch of Christian marriage or you know, Christian romance novels. It's one man, one woman, one flesh, one lifetime. That's God's plan. Now, this is a relatively common thing culturally, that if the wife couldn't get pregnant, then she'd give one of her servants, to her husband to try to then have a baby with. But just because something is common culturally doesn't mean it's correct, amen? Last summer we talked about our enemies, and, and other churches aren't the enemy, uh, other political, um, people from different political beliefs are not the enemy, but we, our enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil. We define the world as a system of beliefs, or the culture around us that is counter to the way of God. And we just are swimming in this culture, and a lot of times we don't even realize it. And there are things that are going to be common culturally around us, but just because everyone else is doing it, just because it's common to live this way, just because it's common to live beyond your means and go deep into debt, that doesn't mean it's correct. Just because it's common to, you know, look at pornography doesn't mean it's correct. Just because it's common to abuse substances like caffeine or alcohol or other things doesn't mean it's correct. And so this is where we have to have the wisdom of God to discern what is common culturally around us that's so easy to give into, but that's not correct. 
And same thing, even just this religious baggage that a lot of times we have to disentangle from. That maybe even you grew up in a church that the, the culture around that was a culture of, uh, of, of unhealthy rules and oppression. And so it's like, okay, we got to disentangle that. Even if I grew up in this way, what does God's word really say? And, and having the wisdom for that. So just because it's common culture doesn't mean it's correct. And now what the Bible records is a huge understatement. I think there's some humor here as, remember, Moses is writing this. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So Sarai says to her 85-year-old husband, she's like, I got this young hottie that works for me. You should go sleep with her and try to have a baby with her. And Abram's like, sure, honey, whatever you want, right? He's like, if this is what it takes, I'll take one for the team. And if it doesn't work the first time, like, I'll keep trying. Like, that's Abram, right? He's like, I'm willing to be a team player, baby. He listens to the voice of her. And, and I love how the Bible puts this drama in here. Because again, if you were trying to write a story of like why to believe uh, in the God of Israel, and why Father Abraham's a great man, you would leave these stories out, right? But these stories are in here to prove this is real life. And Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, they aren't the heroes in the story. The only hero is Jesus, amen? But this is pretty jacked up. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, so he's about 85, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian. I just want to stop there. I think for a long time, even as I read this, I kind of pictured Hagar as more kind of opportunistic, gold digger kind of. like. But I don't know. You can discern for yourself what you think, but I think that word took means a lot that Sarai didn't give Hagar a choice in this matter. She was lower in power. Perhaps she was a slave or a servant of some kind. And she had no choice in this. And she was really wronged by a Brahmin Sarai. And uh, next week, Pastor Ryan's going to talk about the covenant that's going to come out of this. And um, what's fascinating to me uh, is the body part that Abram uses to take advantage of Hagar is the body part that God, next week, spoiler alert, is going to ask him to remove the tip of it and to consecrate and sanctify even that part of Abram that he used to wrong Hagar. Um, and I think there's a direct correlation there. And, and I even wonder sometimes if circumcision wasn't part of the original plan and God's like, all right, Abram, you've brought this on yourself. So I don't know, you can debate that in your community groups. But she took Hagar. She had no part in this. Uh, and, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar and she conceived and does Sarai's plan work? Yes. Yes, her servant gets pregnant. We're going to see her success is actually a huge failure. For many of us, the hardest thing will not be our failures, but our successes that are outside the will of God and the timing of God. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. So now Hagar, the servant, has been forced into a role she didn't want, but now she is pregnant. And so now she's looking at contempt, though, at Sarai. And she's like, ha, ha, ha. She's rubbing her belly. Looking at Sarai, who's infertile. And again, she's not perfect in this. She's not just a victim. And so, so what happens next? This is not good, right? This is a husband and a wife and a girlfriend all together. This is not God's plan. And Sarai said to Abraham, may the wrong done to me be on you. Sarai's not taking any personal accountability, right? She's like, this, this is on you, Abraham. You got her pregnant. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, now she's looking on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. She's saying, it's all your fault, Abram. You know, I gave you a naked woman, and now it's, and, and it's all on you. And he's like, what? How is this my fault? This, is, this was your idea, right? But up until this time, Sarai hasn't prayed to God. She's just complained about him. And I think that's so easy for us, too is that we just can complain about God in the situations, but have we actually talked to him? But her plan works. And I think the only thing harder than waiting on God is wishing that you had. I know, honestly, that hit me this week. <laughs> it's like, man, I don't want to take things into my own hands while I'm waiting and wishing I had waited. Now, I was like, okay, this could be interpreted a lot of different ways, right? 
So there are people in this church that I know you're waiting on things and you're trying to decide, do I act? Do I, am I passive? Am I active? I'm not saying that taking a step for fertility treatments or adoptions or, uh, you know, sending out your resume for a job is, is bad. Like, we just wait on God, right? We talk, we have to know between the difference between active faith and passive faith. But is their actions clearly sin and wrong? Taking a servant who is under them in power and status and forcing her into this role, that's clear sin. And so when we, when we step out and try to make something happen that's clear sin, that's wrong. If it's not clear sin, then you got to pray about that and seek God's direction and decide, do I keep waiting? Because I don't want to be in a point where I wish that I had waiting. So again, life is like this, right? we we got to have God's word. We've got to have God's community, God's spirit in us to discern if something isn't clearly wrong, okay, do I wait? Do I not? Is this, is this of you or not, right? This situation is clearly wrong, what they did. But we can create something out of our frustration to actually multiply the problem to a greater degree. Verse 6, but Abraham said to Sarai, behold, your servant is in your power. He's like, this is, this is your th- whole idea. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. This word dealt harshly is really interesting. Remember, we think Moses wrote this, first five books, to the Israelites who have just come out of Egypt. This word dealt harshly is the same Hebrew word that he's going to use later in the book of Exodus for how Pharaoh dealt harshly with the Israelites. And I just think about that, how the sin of Sarai dealing harshly with this Egyptian is now going to come back on her descendants as the Egyptians dealt harshly with her descendants uh, in Egypt. And so often, if we aren't careful and we give in to sin, our sins can have consequences on our children, our grandchildren, and even our great-grandchildren. God's grace comes in and, and his forgiveness, but consequences are real. And sometimes the decisions we make now can have consequences for generations down the road but but here's the good news but hope is coming so far there's been no heroes in the text abraham passive you know and then gives in to to the easy way out the wife's like here sleep with this other woman he's like sure i'll do it sarai right gets impatient clearly does sin hagar is wrong but then now she's looking at contempt like there's no heroes in the story we're waiting for a hero to come but hope is coming. And then the angel of the Lord found her, Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. Shur is kind of halfway in between Egypt and where they are in the promised land. So she's on her way back down to Egypt. She's had enough. She's going home. She's pregnant. She's like, I'm going home to my parents. I'm running away. And Hagar, this outsider, who's not an Israelite, with perhaps questionable sexual background, as well as a victim of sexual sin, is sitting by a spring of water by herself. And this week as I was thinking about this story, it made me think of John chapter 4. And this Samaritan woman who's not an Israelite with perhaps questionable baggage and background and who probably has been wrong sexually is sitting out by a spring of water. In the wilderness. And who shows up? Oh, it's funny. Jesus. Jesus shows up. And who comes to sit with Hagar? The angel of the Lord. All right, in the Old Testament, uh, is, you, you can dis, you know, discern, interpret this differently how I believe it. That when the Bible says an angel shows up, that's just an angel, a messenger, or a spiritual servant of God. A lot of times they'll say, don't be afraid. But if someone tries to worship him, they're like, hey, don't worship me. No, no, no. And there's other times when it says the angel of the Lord. This is the pre-incarnate Jesus showing up, the hero of the Bible, before he's born of Mary. And the angel of the Lord will receive worship. And, and, and so I believe this is Jesus coming to sit with Hagar. Up until this point, there's no heroes, there's no hope, but now Jesus shows up. And how good is that? Was Hagar looking for Jesus? No, but he's looking for her. 
Does Hagar love or even know Jesus? No. But he knows and loves her. And this woman gets treated with dignity. A foreigner who's been sexually wronged, and God comes and sits with her and gently asks her some questions. And listen to these questions. They're very similar. They echo the questions God asks Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from? Adam, where are you? Where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so they cannot be numbered for multitude. God tells her, go back and submit to your mistress. If you're taking notes, you can write, God's more interested in your submission than in your solution. He says, if you go back and submit to the situation, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to increase your descendants. You're going to lose count of all the ways I'm going to bless you. Maybe this message is for someone who's struggling with staying or going back. Why am I not blessed yet? God's saying it's going to take a little time. You got to just stay in this situation. You got to stay where you are. And when you get blessed, it's going to be bigger than you can possibly imagine. Something good is going to come out of this. Now, again, I feel like I got to say this. If you are in an abusive situation, don't stay. Man, too many churches, I've heard bad teaching on this that, well, the, the wife has to submit to her abusive husband. No, no, no. That is sin and wrong. If you are being abused, we want to help you get help. We want to help you get out of that situation. But if it's not abusive and it's just unpleasant, and, and, and again, this is where you need the Bible, you need the Holy Spirit, you need community to talk with you about the situation. In this situation, God is telling her, go back and submit. I think the abuse stopped from Sarai to Hagar, and there's probably tension. We're going to see in the following chapters is Ishmael, the son, is going to grow up, and then Isaac, and then all this. But I want to be very, very clear on this. God's plan is never for a wife or a husband or anyone to stay in an abusive situation. That is wrong. And if you've been abused, please come talk to me, uh, talk to a trusted counselor. We will get you help. I'm sick and tired of hearing about churches. Uh, John MacArthur's church right now, it's coming out, that elders were accused of being abusive and they covered it up. And they told his wives to go back to their husbands. That is wrong and that is sin. And so abuse is wrong. So that just needs to be clear. But there are times we are in difficult situations. It's not abuse. It's just hard. It could be work. It could be, you know, whatever it might be. And, and we want to run. But God says, hey, you need to go back and submit to this. And there's going to be blessings because the time has not come yet. But it's amazing with what God can do with someone who's submitted to the process. But see, as long as Hagar is blaming people, she can't see God. But here's how I know her blame was blinding her, is that once she met God, here's what she says. She says, so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. Again, this is why I think it's Jesus showing up. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. When she got past the point of blaming, she's able to see God. And she gives this name to God. She names him El Roy, the God who sees me. It can also mean the God who sees me, I have seen. The God who sees me, I have seen. Now, this is huge. See, we're used, especially in Genesis and other times, of God naming people, you know, right? Like, no longer are you Simon, you're going to be Peter. We're going to see next week, spoiler alert, Abram, Sarai become Abraham and Sarah, and they get the divine vowel added to their name. That's why it's a big deal. They both get A-H added to their names. Uh, but their name is changed, their identity is changed. So often God is given a new name, right? Jacob becomes Israel, like all these things. This is the only time in the Bible where someone gives a name to God. And it's a foreign woman who's been wronged and abused. And sometimes she's been called the Bible's first theologian. I love that. I think that's beautiful. And what does she name God? Elroy, the God who sees me. 
the God who I have seen. And somewhere out in the wilderness, Hagar meets God. He said, I have seen you. He says, I have seen your misery. I have seen your shame. I have seen your guilt. I'm going to bless you. Where do you need to be seen? I think for many of us, like Hagar, in the desert, in the wilderness, that's where we most need to be seen. When we feel like we're in a desert, when we feel like we're in a wilderness, God wants you to know he sees you. He sees your pain. He sees your injustice. He sees your side of the story. He sees your abuse. When you feel like no one cares, God sees. When you feel like no one understands, that no one wants you, God does. He is El Roy, the God who sees you. One of my favorite stories in the New Testament, I think it's actually quite possibly the most brilliant story ever written. Uh, It's at least the most brilliant story written in antiquity where Jesus tells a story in Luke 15 of this extravagant father and his two prodigal sons. And if you know the story, I mean, it's, it's so brilliant. There's two sons, and the younger son says to his dad, basically, I wish you were dead, dad, because I'm tired of waiting on my wealth from you. And so the dad gives him his part of the inheritance. And it's a lot of money. It's a lot of wealth. And the son leaves, and he squanders it all on wrong, sinful living. And while he's there feeding a bunch of pigs, and as a good Jewish boy, that was just the lowest of the lows, and, and he's hungry and he's dirty and he's filled with the mud and brokenness and he remembers man the servants in my dad's house are even better taken care of than this and why am I scrounging for food from some dirty unclean pigs when I could go home and at least get a job for my dad and in this culture there's a lot of honor shame very more it's it's an eastern culture very different than ours we're very individualistic and if you had shamed your family There's precedence that the community could come and kill you because you've so dishonored your family and your father. And it says, as the son was still a long way off, where was the father? It says the father sees his son. And that dad, he's a little older now, he's not as spry but he's watching and he's looking for his lost son. And before the community would ever have a chance to do an honor killing and put the punishment on that son that he deserves, that father sees his son. And what does he do? He grabs his robes and something he probably hasn't done in decades and he runs to his son. He sees him, he runs to him, He holds him. He takes off his ring. He gives it to his son. He gives him his own robe, the finest robe, to tell the community, hey, don't touch him. He is my son. And today I want you to know if you feel like that prodigal son who's run away, and and you feel like you're head down and you've been rehearsing your apologies and you've been rehearsing Man, God, I don't even know how to tell you all the ways I'm sorry, but God is looking for you. And while you're still a long ways off, he sees you. And he wants to run to you. That's the God we serve. Let go of all the religious baggage, all the way the churches and Christians have hurt you. Who's God? He's the Father who sees us who runs to us, who throws his arms around us. He's the one that sees us in the wilderness when we're running because it's just been too much, when we've been wronged and abused. He sees us. Last week we said he's the God who bleeds for us, but he isn't just Jesus on a cross paying the price. He rose from the dead and now he's looking and searching for those who are lost. And if you identify with that, with Hagar, or with the prodigal son, I want you to know that all I have to do is turn to him, and he's looking for you. And for those of us who have met Jesus, and we love him, 
and we're so moved by him? Do we just stay in that place of being of belief? We talked about this, right? Blessing, belonging, belief. That's not where it stops. That we become bringers of blessing and belonging and belief. And how do we be bringers of blessing and belonging and belief? Is we see others. There are so many people around us who just want to be seen. Like Avatar, when he, I see you, my Jake. I see you, my son. People are looking for that. How can we be looking for the left out? How can we be looking for the prodigal sons? How can we be looking for the Hagars, those that don't fit in, those who feel lost and broken? How can we be looking for the Sarai's who so desperate want to get pregnant and, and, they're, and it's not working? For the Abrams who feel caught in between, who've made some mistakes? And here's the beautiful thing we'll talk about in coming weeks is that God redeems their mistakes and even though Ishmael's born, he wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, he, God's going to use both Ishmael and Isaac. Genesis 37, we see when Joseph is in a pit and his brothers are thinking about killing him, who comes along? The Ishmaelites. How does Joseph get to Egypt? It's the Ishmaelites. Back down to Egypt. The descendants of that Egyptian who was wrongly taken out of Egypt, they get Joseph down to Egypt to get where he's supposed to be. And so even if you made mistakes, God can redeem those regrets. God can still work those out for good. So this morning, know that if you feel like you've been lost and broken and you feel unseen and you're dealing with hidden pain and hurts and brokenness, God sees you. And Jesus wants to give you dignity and worth and value. And for those of us who have met Jesus, we got to ask ourselves, how can I see others? This weekend, we had a beautiful opportunity. On Friday night, a whole bunch of our teenagers, I love that, and a bunch of our adults helped serve some families in our community who fostered kids, adopted, single parents, and said, hey, we want to give you the option to have a night out. And they played with these kids, and a lot of them were kind of nervous coming in. By the end of the night, they didn't want to leave. And I love we're teaching our junior hires to see these kids, right, to see these families. How beautiful is that? I hear talk, right, young people are leaving the church and that the church doesn't want to let go of control and leadership. I love that Ryan, who's 23, is leading that on Friday night. And I said, hey, it's all yours. That's amazing. Gen Z in the house, amen. Because God's church is for everybody. And our junior hires are there seeing those kids. And then Saturday about a dozen, 15 or so of our, of our, of our youth group goes, goes tubing, right? They're having fun. They're serving together. That's what it means to be in a church family. And we're teaching our kids. We're teaching our teens. We're teaching our dolls to go see people. Because God is a God of seeing. Amen? I invite the band up. Uh, we're going to close in prayer. God, I thank you that you see us even when we make horrible mistakes, when we mess up, you still see us. God, when we bear the weight and frustration of, of waiting on your promises and we believe that you've called us to something and we believe you've put this in us, but we're waiting and we don't know and, and we're frustrated that, God, that you see that frustration. You see that uncertainty. God, those who have been wronged and, and abused and hurt, God, you see their abuse. You, you see their pain. And you don't just stay distant, but you run like the Father. And while we're still a long ways off, you run to us and you embrace us and you welcome us back home. So God, I pray right now for the prodigals, for the Hagars, for the Sarais, for the Abrams in the room. God, that they would know that you are a good God, a good Father who sees them, who loves them. And your desire is to just be in a relationship with them. God, I pray for those of us who are in a relationship and, and we love you, Jesus, and we think you're the most amazing thing in, we've ever heard of and we're blown away by your love and compassion in our lives and we just, we just wanna worship you, God. 
I pray, God, that we wouldn't just get so stuck on that of just me and, and, and Jesus, but, God, that we would see others around us. God, that you'd give us eyes to see those who feel left out, who feel on the margins, who feel forgotten, who, who feel like they don't matter. God, move us to action. Let us move towards the pain and brokenness. God, let us show the love of the Father as we run to those prodigals. God, as we see families in our community who may feel like they don't matter because they don't fit into the stereotypical mold of, uh, of two parents and two kids and a dog and a house. God, let us see those who are silently struggling with sin and addiction and, and they're just hiding it. God, let us be a people that sees because you are a God who sees. We thank you. Thank you, God, for your love and grace in our lives. God, thank you for our amazing junior high and high school students who are playing in our worship band, who are serving kids on Friday night, who are having fun together. God, I, I just want to thank you for Amber and Maria and, and Sherry and, and, and so many of our adults who are investing in kids back there, teaching them to see you, teaching them to see the other kids. God, thank you for that. Let us be a community that continues to see you, God, and to see those around that need to feel your love and grace. Be with us now as we close out. Help us to have eyes to see you, just a clear picture of who you are. In your name we pray, amen. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to go out for singing. And my hope and my desire is that you just have a clear picture of who Jesus is and that you too would just, you'd fall in love with him. As we sing this song, you'd be moved that as we sing to him, as we raise our hands and in the same way that some of us maybe will be cheering as we watch a football game, we have that same excitement towards God. We'd, we'd raise our hands like someone who's done a great play or a great halftime show and be like, God, man, I'm so excited. I'm so in love with you. I just want to show my excitement to you. So as the band leads us in this last song, let's just give that excitement to him. And then we're going to head out to the lobby. Uh, we're going to transition to a time of, of, of eating together and, and playing together because that's one of our core values is eating together, building community by eating together and playing together. So let's do that and have fun. But may you know that God sees you, whatever it is you're going through. Let's sing to him.